Hello, hello, hello. I welcome you all to this live session by Great Learning. And today we will have a comprehensive session on this amazing domain known as machine learning. Now, you might have heard of this term machine learning and it might sound scary to you as maybe someone who has no idea about machine learning. So we have brought this live session so that I can clear all of the doubts with respect to this field called as machine learning. And I want this to be a very interactive session. So whatever questions or suggestions you have, please keep putting them up in the chat. And also give me a confirmation if you can see my screen and if you can hear me properly. So in the chat, just give me a yes. So just write down yes if you can see my screen and if you can hear me properly, that would be amazing. And in the meanwhile, while you give me a confirmation, I'd like to tell you guys about Great Learning Academy. So what I'll do is I'll actually reduce my screen size over here and I will open up Great Learning Academy. And this is a free learning initiative by Great Learning where you have access to more than 100 courses. So as you see over here, we got courses with respect to data science, ML, AI, cloud computing, marketing and finance, and a lot more. And once you complete any of these courses, you will get a course completion certificate that you can go ahead and add onto your resume or onto your LinkedIn page. And that, my friends, will be a huge value add to you guys. And also, all of these courses have been developed by industry experts, so your learning experience would be amazing. I can assure you that. So link for Great Learning Academy would be available to you in the chat section. So someone from my team would be putting up the link of Great Learning Academy in the chat. And also, let's say if you do not have a laptop with you or a desktop with you during this time of pandemic, and if you'd want to learn through a phone, we also have the Great Learning app. So you'll also find the link of Great Learning app in the chat. So on that note, we will start off today's session. So let me just open up today's presentation over here. And as I've been telling you folks, I want this session to be extremely interactive. Whatever questions you have, whatever suggestions you have, keep them putting out over here. Um, so Line Brother, uh, so I understand that you're very excited for this session, but just please don't spam because uh, if you spam in the chat section, that would uh, you know that would hinder the learning experience of other attendees over here. Uh, so just make sure that you maintain the decorum of the live session. Syed is asking, can you please arrange some sessions for deep learning as well? Definitely, Syed. We will be definitely having a live session on AI, and the next week we are doing something absolutely amazing. We will have a round table discussion where all of the SMEs will discuss everything about the domains which we have. So Monday, it will be me and Sampriti who will have a engaging and a fun discussion in the field of data science. So it will be just two friends, two experts in the field of data science who will be talking about their experience in the field of data science, how they got into the field of data science and, you know, how a fresher can get into the field and a lot, lot more things would be discussed. So the next week would be absolutely amazing. You can check out about these on Great Learning Academy. So folks, also before starting off, I'd... Uh, request you guys to also like the session. So I see that there's a watching of 51 and we only have 18 likes. Now, uh, it'd be amazing if you can, uh, you know, make it 51 likes because if you like the video, if you have more likes on the video, more people will get to know that we are conducting this live session and more people will join and even they can learn this uh, domain about machine learning. So please do like it. And also, if you haven't yet subscribed to our channel, please do subscribe and also click on the bell icon because whenever we upload any of the videos or whenever we uh, you know, take any live sessions, you will be immediately notified. So please subscribe and also please do like the video. And on that note, we will start off with today's session. So a complete guide to become an expert in ML. So we'll be covering a lot of things today. And the first thing to understand in the field of machine learning is 
well, you'll be dealing with a lot of data. So what exactly is data? What comes to your mind when I say the term data? Now, I would want uh, you guys to put it up in the chat. I'll wait for a couple of uh, seconds over here. And there also might be your stream delay. So I would want you to answer what comes to your mind when you hear the term data. Let's start off the session with an interaction. I'm waiting for your answers. Josh Maria says information, Fahina says information. I'd want more answers, folks. Om Shai is saying set of information. Okay. Well, we have a lot of people watching. I'd want answers from everyone. Okay, so a lot of people are saying information. Um, so my answer to you guys would be data is not exactly information. So to tell you what exactly is data. Now, when I say data is collection of facts. So whatever you see in the world right in front of you, that is data. I'll also be telling you the difference between data and information. So when you're dealing with numbers such as 23, 8000, 3.14 or even complex numbers such as 3 plus 4i, these numbers that you're dealing with is data. When you say sentences such as this is Sparta, Joey loves pizza or uh, any other sentence, these again, uh, so whatever statements you make, that again is data. Now, data is not just limited to numbers and text. Data can also be present in the form of pictures and videos. And especially since the boom of social media, especially since the boom of internet, we have a lot of information in the form of images and video. So when you combine all of this data together, that is when you will, uh, you know, when you combine all of these facts together, that is what is collectively known as data. And some of you folks have told data is equal to information. So I just like to point out that data is raw. So you don't really have anything insightful when you look at the data. But if uh, you know, if you if you are able to find meaning from the raw data, that is what is known as information. So that is just a minute difference between data and information. So data is absolutely raw. The meaning or the insights which you find from this raw data is what actually known as information. So now that we know what exactly is data, let's understand how the data was maybe around three or four decades back and how the data is now. So around maybe three or four decades back, the data was extremely small and extremely structured. When I say data was small, data was present in kilobytes. Now, uh, so maybe around 15 years back, you would have the storage device called as a floppy disk. And the storage size of this floppy disk was only 512 kilobytes. Right. So you, you can imagine how small that is a storage device. And the maximum storage capacity of this floppy disk is only 512 kilobytes. And that was because we did not really have any digital information or digital data back then. So that is why data back then was very small. And also when I say that data was extremely structured, what do I mean by that? So when I say data was structured, data was mostly present in the form of numbers and text. Since we did not have the social media boom or the internet boom, data was only present in the form of numbers and text. Now, dealing with this sort of data was extremely simple. But data right now is huge. You have terabytes of data being generated every single minute. And all of this data is unstructured. Now, when I say unstructured, this means that we have data not only in the form of numbers and text, but also in the form of images and videos. And dealing with all of this data might be a bit difficult. So why am I telling you folks about all of this? What is the need of this? Because we are sitting on this huge amount of data and 
if we can actually leverage this data to our use, that can be extremely useful to us. That can be extremely beneficial to us. And this is where data science or machine learning comes in. And with the help of data science, you are actually converting this raw data into meaningful information. So this is what you guys need to understand. So now that you know what is the need of data science or machine learning, let's look at a simple machine learning use case. Now, this is a very interesting use case. So let's say you're just uh, sitting in your couch and suddenly you get a message from your bank stating that you have spent 50,000 rupees to buy a diamond necklace and you made this purchase from a jewelry store in Australia. So 50,000 rupees to buy a diamond necklace and this is from a jewelry store in Australia. But the problem is you've never been outside of India and you've never made a purchase of more than 10,000 rupees during a single transaction. And your bank is now asking you to verify if you actually made this transaction. So now you're in an absolute shock. So the thing over here to understand is how does your bank know that this might actually be a fraudulent transaction? So here the bank directly did not allow the entire transaction to go through. It has asked you for permission. Now that is because your bank uses a lot of machine learning algorithms at the back end, which analyzes all of your transactions. So these machine learning algorithms know that uh, you know, your transactions or your spending pattern is normally in the range of zero to 10,000 rupees and you've never made any purchase, whether offline or online outside of India. So when there's a transaction of 50,000 rupees and that too in Australia, the machine learning algorithm immediately flags it off as, uh, as an anomaly and it asks you to verify if this transaction was done by you. So this is how machine learning works. And these are some real world examples which a machine learning engineer works on. So now that I've given you guys a context, let me actually head back to the chat and see if you have any questions over here. Three team for Tinker is asking data is the collection of raw facts. Yes, that is absolutely right. Santosh is saying data is digitized information with various complexity. Uh, data can also be present in the form of physical copies. But then again, since, uh, you know, if we have to deal with data, if we have to analyze data, then you would have to convert this physical data into digital data. Srinidhi is asking us to come up with an end-to-end -end machine learning model deployment on web. Sure. We actually would have uploaded a, a video on model deployment using Flask around three or four days ago. So you can definitely check that out. Techno Villagers is asking is ML and AI same? That's a very interesting question. And to answer that, I would say that machine learning is a subset of artificial intelligence. And what is, actually, uh, what is artificial intelligence? So you can consider artificial intelligence to be that particular domain where computers or machines are able to show human-like intelligence. And there are ways to achieve artificial intelligence. One of the ways is machine learning and the other way is deep learning. So simply put, ML is the subset of AI and through ML and DL, you can achieve artificial intelligence. So I hope that answers your question. So Jalpesh, uh, you have the same question and I've answered that. So again, I will head back to our presentation for today. So now that we have looked at the use case, let's actually look at the entire data mining or data science life cycle. So our first step in the data science life cycle would be to acquire the data because without the data, you can't really do anything. So first you'll acquire the data. Now, once you have the data, you'd have to pre-process it. Now, once you pre-process the data, this is when the main stage comes in. 
this is where you'll be applying all of the machine learning algorithms and these machine learning algorithms will give you a result or an insight that you'd have to evaluate and if the result if you find it to be fine you show them in the form of beautiful graphs so this is in brief about the data science life cycle now let's understand about all of these stages comprehensively so first stage is data acquisition now when it comes to data acquisition the problem is as i've told you especially uh, during this particular time you have data which is coming from multiple sources and this is huge amount of data and this data is also present in multiple formats you have data present in the form of pdf files excel files word documents and this is just one type now apart from this you also have data in the form of images and videos as well now the if you, let's say if you're working on a problem statement your first step would be to collect all of this data from whatever source it is coming and store them at one single location and you call that single storage space or your primary storage space as your data warehouse and over here at the data warehouse you integrate this data now when i say integrate this data what i mean is you have all of this data of different formats so you would have to combine them and convert them into a single format depending on whatever your problem statement is now once that is done now because since you have a lot of data you would have to actually understand what are the factors which can help me to find the answer to my problem statement so from whatever data you have you figure out what are the essential data points which i want so let's say if you have around 30 factors out of those 30 factors maybe you'll choose only around 15 factors and those 15 factors you'll consider them as your target data and on this target data you will start your analytical process so this is your first stage now once you acquire the data next is data pre processing and this is where most of the time goes in a data science life cycle and that is because when you have raw data you have a lot of problems with it so you have problems such as missing value so let's say if you're working on an excel file then you might have certain entries where there is absolutely no value or you have some gibberish in one particular record so all of these need to be sorted out you also have cases where maybe the name of the column is incorrect or the name of the column doesn't make sense and also there might be cases where let's say uh, there would be a lot of anomalies so when i say anomalies let's say if you have 50 records out of those 40 records would represent one particular value and the rest of the 10 records might have a totally exaggerated value or a value which does not make sense so you have all of these different problems and this data is known as untidy data so in the data pre processing stage you convert this untidy data into tidy data and how do we do that we have two particular methods over here one method is known as data manipulation and another method is known as data visualization and these two help you to find simple insights from whatever data you're working on so let's understand the first step which is data manipulation so when it comes to data manipulation i'll again give you guys a simple example so let's say your manager comes up to you and gives you this huge excel sheet which has let's say 1000 columns and a million records and out of this he wants you to find out all of the employees whose salary is let's say greater than 10 lakhs and also whose age is greater than 30 now would you actually go through every single record i mean you have 1 million records over there and going through every single record is it is extremely time consuming and it is actually stupidity on your part so what you do over here is you use languages or tools such as python r and sql and these languages or these tools help you to get to the answer with just a single line of code 
So now, if I have to find out all of the employees whose age is greater than 30 and whose salary is uh, greater than 10 lakhs, I'll just write one line of code and I will get my result. So these are the sort of insights which you can get through data manipulation. Now, similarly, if you take the same example, if you look at this huge Excel sheet, which has, uh, which has 1 million records and 10,000 columns, you, if you just look at the sheet, you will not be able to find out anything. But on the other hand, if I actually show you a beautiful graph, it could be a pie chart, it could be a bar graph, or it could be a scatter plot. So if I show you a beautiful graph, you will automatically be able to find out insights from whatever data you have. So these two are, that is why the primary component or these two are where you have to invest most amount of your time during the entire data science life cycle. So this is the data pre-processing stage. Now, once we are done with data pre-processing, then comes the machine learning stage. And over here, once we have pre-processed the data and once we have the tidy data with us, depending on the problem statement, you will implement your machine learning algorithms. And you have a lot of different machine learning algorithms. So you have classification algorithms, regression algorithms and clustering algorithm. We'll understand about all of these once we are as we are progressing through the session. So just for now, understand that once we have uh, the tidy data, will be applying any of these algorithms depending on whatever the problem statement is. And once we apply these intelligent algorithms, we will get a result. Now, once we get a result, we would have to again check if the result is correct and useful because you've only applied a machine learning algorithm, but the algorithm which you applied you know, there, uh, it's not necessary that it might give you a result with 100% uh, accuracy or 90% accuracy. And to be honest, when it comes to industry standards, if you actually build a machine learning algorithm, which gives you around 65 to 70% accuracy, that is considered great. Because if you actually have an accuracy of 90% or 100%, what you're doing is actually predicting something and that is truly magical, isn't it? And to develop those extremely complex machine learning systems, which give you more than 90% accuracy, they take a lot of time. They probably take around years and years of time, right? So that is why you'd have to, uh, this is an iterative process and you'd have to keep on checking if the result which you've got, it is accurate enough or not. Now, once you evaluated the result and you found out that this has given me decent enough accuracy, you will go ahead and show your results in the form of beautiful graphs to your stakeholders or to your clients. Now, this is important to show your information in the form of uh, pictures because, well, you might be a data scientist or a data analyst or a machine learning engineer, but your client would not have that technical expertise. And since you are actually representing your client or your stakeholder, you'd have to present these pictures because these pictures are what would make sense to him. So this is the entire life cycle. This is the entire data science life cycle. And in this entire data science life cycle, we'll be focusing on the machine learning part. So now, We'll understand machine learning again with this beautiful example. And before I start this off again, let me go to the chat section and see if there are any questions. And folks, um, again, if you haven't yet liked the video, please do like it. So let's hit 100 likes in another five minutes. That would be amazing. And that would encourage us to keep conducting these live sessions on a regular basis. And also to the folks who have just joined in this uh, live session. And if you haven't yet subscribed to our channel, please go ahead and subscribe and also hit on the bell icon because it will give you notifications whenever we are taking these live sessions and also, uh, you know, um, also whenever we are uploading new videos, you will be notified about that. So I'm just going through the questions in the chat for now.
Satish is asking why do we call it as data manipulation instead of calling data cleansing? Because data cleansing is actually a part of data manipulation. So when it comes to data cleansing, the only thing what you're doing is you are uh, just converting your untidy data into raw data. But data manipulation is much, much more than that. You're also finding insights from your tidy data, isn't it? So the example which I've given you. So again, I'll give you another example. So let's say if you have a class strength of 100 students and out of those 100 students, I'd want to understand how many of the students have scored exactly uh, or maybe how many of the students have scored less than 20 marks. So now this is what you're doing is not data cleansing. What you're doing is finding information. And what you're doing is you're manipulating the data a bit to find information from this. So this entire thing is known as data pre-processing or data manipulation. And when you include data manipulation and data visualization together, the term is known as exploratory data analysis. And you call that exploratory data analysis because you're actually exploring the data which you have. So I hope that answers your question. Ajay is asking, I have eight years of experience in logistics and supply chain, but now I want to switch my profession. Can I take a chance in data science? Absolutely. Uh, so the answer to whether I'd have to switch to data science should always be yes. But there are a lot of factors again, which you'd have to consider over here. So there is one fact which I'd like to tell you because right now, data science is not a value add anymore. Data science is an absolute necessity in whatever field you're working in, whether it is logistics, whether it is, uh, you know, whether it is e-commerce, whether it is finance, whether it is biotechnology, whatever domain you're working on, data science has pervaded all the domains and it is an absolute necessity in any domain you work with because all of the domains use data and finding insights from that data is what provides value to the company or boosts the company's revenue. Now to answer your second question, when you say that you have eight years of experience and you want to switch into the field of machine learning, what you'd have to consider is if you'd want to switch to a role of a data scientist or a data analyst, here the problem is since you're from a different background, you'd normally be getting the roles of a junior data scientist or a junior data analyst or maybe a junior machine learning engineer because the first eight years you had no experience in the field of analytics. So what I'd actually suggest you is learn data science completely and use it in your field. And once you're good with that, maybe you can start competing in, uh, you know, in more, uh, you can start working on more open size projects. And after working on open source projects, you have sites such as Kaggle. You can go to Kaggle and, uh, you know, participate in different competitions. So as and when you improve your skill sets, that is when you can target these, uh, you know, core machine learning positions or core data science positions. And trust me, if you have the skills, you will definitely get the job. Irrespective of, let's say you have two years of experience or 15 years of experience in some other field. If you have the skill sets, the company will definitely hire you because at the end of the day, what a company needs is an employee who will finish the tasks on time and who can provide value to the company. And if you're someone who can do that, then you will definitely get that dream job of yours. Chill Frosty says up Hindi mein data science pe class banane wale the. Definitely hum Hindi mein bhi banayenge. Uh, abhi filhal uh, ek do hafto ke liye hum kuch aur chizo pe kam kar rahe. But Hindi data science wale pe bhi hum ek full course definitely conduct karne wale hai. Vijay is asking, can you share your personal journey? Definitely, uh, 
So when you are asking to share my personal journey, this is something which I'll be discussing on Monday's podcast. So on Monday, we have something called as a data science podcast where I and Sampriti, Sampriti is also an SME in our team. So I and Sampriti will discuss our journey in the field of data science and we'll also talk about the trends and career options in the year 2021. So please do attend that because that will be extremely fun and extremely insightful. So over there, you will not really have any PPTs or coding. It's just uh, two friends talking about their experience in the field of data science. Identity Care is asking, can data be only in the form of numbers or letters or can it be also in the form of images? Uh, I've answered this in the start of the session itself. Data is present in a lot of formats and that is why it is called as unstructured data. So when you have data in the form of images and videos or as you suggested, x-rays. Now, when you combine all of this data, what is known as unstructured data and what machine learning or I'd say rather computer vision, computer vision, what it deals with is with this unstructured data, which is images and videos. So I'll just take up one more question before we head on to the session. Om Shah is asking, is this video helpful for me if I'm a beginner? Definitely. So I started this video from the absolute basics and I'll be covering all of the basics in this session. So this would definitely be a value add to you guys. All right. Uh, so on that note, we will head back to our session. So now let's understand what exactly is machine learning. So what do you see in this slide? What is this exactly? It's a fish, isn't it? And now what is this? Well, this again is a fish. And what is this? Well, this again is a fish. Now you guys must be thinking, why am I even showing you these images of fish? Like, how is it even important to this session? Um, well, I have an interesting point to put forward. So now, how do you know all of these are actually fish? Can you answer that? You've looked at this image. You know that this is a fish. But how do you know this is a fish? This is a very stupid question. I understand that, but uh, please do put down your answers over here. How do you know that this is a fish? I'm just waiting for your answers. I'll wait for a couple of seconds for you guys to answer. Josh Maria says fins, gills, scales, and tail. So what do you actually mean is a uh, fish has fins, a fish has scales, a fish has gills, and that is why we know it as a fish. Bunsi says because it swims. Saranj says shape and size. Teen Footinker says they look like and are fishes. That's a, <laughs> that's a very funny answer, uh, Tinker. <laughs> A fish absolutely looks like a fish. No denying that. Right. So as Saranj says, because of its shape and size. And now, as a kid or, uh, you know, as a kid, you would have been told by your kindergarten teacher or your parents that this is a fish. So you might have come across a picture of a fish or you might have seen a real fish. And uh, as a very curious kid, you would have went up to your teacher or your parents and would have asked what exactly is this and your parents would have told that this is a fish now your brain immediately attaches this name called as fish with this entity or with this shape and size called as fish and now your brain automatically learns that so the next time whenever you see anything in this shape or size it will automatically tag it with the name fish, isn't it? And also some of you have, some of you folks have said that a fish has a tail, a fish has fins, a fish has gills, a fish has two eyes, and you know, it looks in the shape of a balloon. 
so your brain has learned all of these features and when your brain uh, or next, uh, when your brain uh, you know when you see uh, a new fish it automatically recognizes these shapes or these features associated with the fish and it associates the name of fish with this shape and size and this is how our brain functions but i have another question for you folks what if i feed these images of fish to a machine or a computer will a machine be able to identify that this is a computer well this is where machine learning comes in so what i'll do is I'll keep feeding all of these images of fish. Maybe I'll feed 10,000 images or maybe even a million images of fish to this computer so that it learns all of the features associated with this. Right? And what we're doing is we are just mimicking how our brain functions. So our brain whenever it looks at this, it has learned the features. and that is what we are doing over here i'll take millions of pictures of different types of fishes of different shapes of different sizes of uh, maybe uh, you know you will have uh, coral reef fishes you will have salt water fishes you will have uh, uh, you will have fresh water fishes i'll take all of these different species of fish and i'll feed them to this machine and what i'm doing over here is i'm making sure that this machine learning algorithm learns all of the features associated with this image and once it learns all of the features associated with it i will give it new data or test data so here as you see i've given a completely new image of a fish to this machine and if this machine has been trained properly or the machine learning algorithm the underlying machine learning algorithm has been trained properly then it will immediately recognize that this is a fish and this machine is able to tag this image with this text called as fish now a perfect example of this could be um your facebook photos so let's say if you have a group photo in facebook and if you hover your mouse on uh, any of your friends pictures it automatically uh, puts up the name of that person isn't it now how is that possible again my friends the answer is machine learning so this was a simple example of what is machine learning so now that we understand what is machine learning let's look at the categories of machine learning which are supervised learning and unsupervised learning so i'll start off with the first one which is supervised learning and when it comes to supervised learning you have two things to keep in mind you have something known as an input variable and the output variable the input variable is denoted with x and the output variable is denoted with y and we try to understand how does y vary with x and simply put it is a it is known as y is a function of x now when we say y is a function of x we can also say that y is the dependent variable and x is the independent variable because y is dependent on this value of x that is why y is your dependent variable and x is your independent variable and this is how supervised learning works you have input variables and output variables we try to understand how does an output variable change with respect to the input variable and in supervised learning again we have two categories the first category would be regression and the second category would be classification now again before i head on to these categories let me head back to the chat and take some more of your questions and uh, also guys so uh, we have see uh, i see that more people have joined in and if you haven't it like the video please go ahead and press the like button so i see that there are 104 likes if you can make it up to 120 likes that would again be amazing so if you can make it 120 likes in the next 5 minutes that would be great and also to the new folks who have joined in if you haven't it subscribe to our channel please hit the subscribe button and also click the bell icon so i am just taking up some of your questions right now
Minhajuddin Ansari is asking, where can I learn data science for free? Are great learning YouTube videos enough to learn data science? Absolutely, uh, Minhajuddin. So I'll actually give you a tour of Great Learning Academy again. So as you see, if you'd want to learn everything about data science, we've got this entire data science track covered over here. So in this data science track, you see that we have got maybe around 11 free courses in total. So you can go through all of these courses for absolutely free. And once you complete any of this course, you will get a course completion certificate. So the link for this again will be available to you in the chat. So someone from my team would be putting that up. So this will definitely help you. So I'm just going through your questions. Saransh is saying one like for Kohli personality, sir. Yes, absolutely. Kohli is our brand ambassador and a like for Virat Kohli. Lakshmi is asking what is the difference between regression and classification? That is something we will be covering right now. Atul Kumar Pandey is asking how to decide which algo to use and reason behind it. That is also something which I'll be covering in this session itself. So give it a bit of time. Mohamed Hashir is asking, I'm 16 and want to be an AI researcher. Can you tell me the roadmap for that? Uh, Hashir, you're just 16, so do not put a lot of burden yourself. So for now, just uh, I believe you would be in your high school. Just take your high school study seriously. And it is amazing to see that you have interest in artificial intelligence at the age of 16. And once you get into the college, that is when you you know you need to properly focus on artificial intelligence. For now, just research on small topics, you know, you can maybe watch a couple of documentaries on artificial intelligence, you can learn about the latest trends in artificial intelligence, and keep yourself updated about whatever is happening in this field. But since you're only 16, do not stress a lot, you have a long way to go, my friend. Saransh is asking, we're beginners, so why do PG type of programs on the website? Uh, Saransh, to answer that, so we have Great Learning Academy and we also have the PG courses. On Great Learning Academy, whatever courses we have, they are, ex uh, they are designed for beginners. They are designed for folks like you and they are free. But for folks who are serious about a switch to data science, right? So there was someone who has asked uh, with eight years of experience and how can he switch to data science? So just for those sort of folks who take, uh, you know, who would want to take this up seriously. And uh, because these are comprehensive PG programs, which are around six to 12 months long. So when you have a comprehensive training of six to 12 months long and also our instructors, uh, they have their PhDs from Ivy League schools such as Stanford and also we have a lot of professors from IITs, NITs and IISC. So you'll be getting training from all of these folks. You will be getting hands-on mentor mentorship from all of these folks. There'll be a lot of projects which you'll be working on. There'll be a lot of assignments which you'll be working on. So the aim of the PG courses is completely different and the aim of the courses which are there on GLA are completely different. So I hope that answers your question, Saransh. Kuldeep is asking, does this channel have a roadmap for web development? Uh, that is something which we are working on and will definitely add that. So maybe we'll uh, upload that next week. So Saranj, though, so when I say industrial projects that you'll get in the PG programs, so there you have personal guidance. Now, let's say uh, just looking at a project statement and doing by yourself is completely different and doing it under the mentorship of a professor who has uh, you know 
who has academic experience in top league schools is totally different. And also we have these regular hackathons which we conduct regularly when it comes to these PG programs. And also if you'd want to write any research paper, that is also something which our mentors will help you out with. Right. So I'll just take maybe again one more question and I'll head back to today's topic. Rahul is asking Django Kabaiga. Uh, Rahul Django pe kaam kar rahe hum log. Most probably January 2nd week tak aajayega Django. So, thoda sa patience. Fir pakka milega aapko Django. Mohamad Hashir is saying I've started learning Python. That's very good to know Hashir. Right. Um, so I'll head back to my presentation right now. Keep putting up your questions. Keep putting up your suggestions. I'll again take them up uh, in a bit of time. So we just covered supervised learning and in supervised learning, we've got these two categories, which are regression and classification. And now I'll start with this uh, subdomain or a uh, machine learning algorithm called as classification. And we have this beautiful example over here. So classification in simple terms, as the name suggests, you classify an item into a particular category. I repeat it again. You classify an item into a particular category. Now, to give you an example over here. So let's say you have a lot of patients in a hospital and uh, you're trying to do sort of a survey or a research and you're trying to understand what is the correlation between a person smoking and that person having cancer. So here, smoking, whether the person smokes or not, would be the independent variable and whether the person has cancer or not would be the dependent variable. So what I'm saying is you're trying to understand if the patient has cancer on the basis of whether this person smokes. So here, now also when it comes to classification, you'd have to understand that your dependent variable needs to be categorical in nature. So when I say categorical, as you see over here, you have yes and no, right? You have categories. So your dependent variable definitely has to be categorical in nature for it to be your classification problem. And here, uh, so what we are essentially doing is you maybe have data of 100 patients and you have two columns over there. One column would tell you if the person smokes or not. Another column would tell you if the person has cancer or not. And on the basis of this first column, you're trying to classify this patient as whether this person has uh, cancer or not. This is a very simple example of classification. Now, I'll give you another example. So in classification, we have this algorithm called as decision tree. And uh, again, I'll give you a very interesting example. So let's say if you'd want to watch this movie Avengers Endgame, and you're not really able to make up this decision. So the answer to this is yes or no, isn't it? So yes, you will watch the movie or no, you will not watch the movie. So this is a so this is a problem statement where your uh, dependent variable is categorical in nature and that is why this is a classification problem. So in decision tree, what you'll do is you have a top down approach. So first you will ask your friend whether he likes Robert Downey Jr. So he'll either say yes or no. And if he says yes, again, you'll ask him whether he likes Marvel movies. And if he likes Marvel movies, again, you'll ask this person if he likes Scarlett Johansson. And if the answer is yes to all of these three questions, then you will definitely recommend him to watch the movie Avengers Endgame. So this is how you're reaching the final classification answer on the basis of a set of questions. So this is how classification works. So next up, we have this uh, algorithm called as regression. And in regression, 
again we just try to understand the relationship between y and x but this time your dependent variable is numerical in nature so for this the example would be let's say um, on the x axis you have the cgpa of the students and on the y axis you have the gre score of the students right and you're doing this uh, survey on a bunch of college students so again maybe you go to around uh, 200 to 300 odd college students and you ask them what is their cgpa uh, what is the CGPA in the first four years, maybe, or first three and a half years? And if they have given the GRE score, uh, if they have given GRE, you'll also ask them what is the GRE score. And now, you have two columns over here. First column would be CGPA, which you'll be denoting on the X axis. Next column would be GRE score, which you'll be denoting on the Y axis. And you make a simple plot out of this. So here, as you see, as the CGPA of the student increases, the GRE score of the student also increases linearly. So you see the straight line over here and uh, you see this linear relationship which grows like this. So what is actually happening over here is, so as and when, so you see this as the CGPA increases from 7 to 10, the GRE score also increases from 290 to 340. So this is a linear relationship between the CGPA and the GRE score. But now what if I change the question? What if I actually ask if the CGPA of the student is 8.32, what would be the GRE score of the student? And this is where linear regression comes in. So here, what I'll do is I will draw a vertical line like this. So here, Let's say if 8.32 is over here, I'll draw a vertical line like this and I will draw a horizontal line onto the y-axis. And when I draw a horizontal line onto the y-axis, this might tell me that the GRE score would be around 312. So this is how linear regression works. So when the CGPA is 8.32, the GRE score is 312. So here, uh, since your y-axis or your dependent variable is numerical in nature, you have used linear regression over here. So some of you folks were asking me to explain about regression and classification. And also you folks were asking me to give some real world examples. So I've explained you what is regression. I've explained you folks what is classification. And I've also given you guys to, uh, some real life examples of both of these. And I see that we have only seven minutes left. So I'll also quickly cover up the last topic for today, which is unsupervised learning. So in supervised learning, you'd have to understand that whatever data you have, you have labels associated with it. So if I go back here, you see that you have a label. So cancer, yes or no. Smoking, yes or no. You have labels over here. Similarly, you have labels such as CGPA and GRE score. But when it comes to unsupervised learning, you have input data, but you will have no class labels. And we have a very beautiful example again over here. You have this collection of images. And here you have images of cars and bicycles. And understand that these are only images without any labels or without any text. So uh, what I mean by that is you don't have a label for this stating that this is a car. You don't have a label over here stating that this is a bicycle. And now what I'll do is I'll take all of this data and I will be building an unsupervised learning algorithm on top of this data which has no class labels. And this unsupervised learning algorithm will give me two clusters. The first cluster will have only the cars in it. The second cluster will have only the bicycles in it. And this is very interesting to note over here because even though there are no class labels, this unsupervised learning algorithm was able to divide this into two clusters. So how is this unsupervised learning uh, algorithm able to do this? Well, this was done on the basis of the similarity of data points. 
So here, as you see in this cluster, you have only cars, which means that the cars are very similar to each other. Similarly, in this picture, you have only bicycles, which means that they are very similar to each other. And you have two terms to note over here. The first term is known as intra-cluster similarity. And the second term to understand is inter-cluster dissimilarity. So when I say intra-cluster similarity, here as you see intra-cluster, which means that within a cluster, you see that all of these data points are very similar to each other uh, because all of these are cars. Similarly, here intra-clusters, which means that uh, within the cluster, all of these are bicycles and that is why they are very similar to each other. But when I take these two clusters, if I compare cars and bicycles, they are very dissimilar to each, each other. And that is what I mean by inter-cluster dissimilarity. So this is how some of your unsupervised learning algorithm works. And here, clustering is an example of unsupervised learning. So guys, this was a comprehensive introduction to machine learning. So we've understood what is machine learning. We've looked at the entire data science life cycle and we've also looked at the categories under machine learning. So let me quickly head back to the chat and take up some of your questions again. Tinker is saying uh, unsupervised learning works on the basis of features. Yes, absolutely. King Lion is asking, how can I learn AI? Uh, when it comes to AI, there'd be three or four pillars. The first pillar would be mathematics and statistics. You would have to know about things such as, um, let's say, linear algebra. You'd have to know about matrices. You'd have to know about, um, again, statistics, again, is a whole new domain. So these are some things which you'd have to know in maths and statistics. After that, you would definitely have to know this programming language called as Python. Because most of the deep learning frameworks which you use for AI such as PyTorch, Keras and TensorFlow are in Python. So Python is essentially important for AI and also you'd have to know these deep learning, uh, deep learning frameworks as well. So these are some things which you'd have to get started with. And again, if you'd want to learn deep learning or AI, we again have a track over here for artificial intelligence. So as you see, so we've got this intro to deep learning, we've got neural networks, we've also got a course on computer vision, digital image processing, and also we've got this introductory course on TensorFlow and Keras. You can go over here and check out all of these courses for sure. Let me take up uh, a few more questions before we end the session. Nitish is asking, how can I get a job in data science right after college? Interesting question, Nitish. So in college, you'd have to work on a lot of open source projects, make up a GitHub profile, and uh, whatever projects you work on, keep uploading them on your GitHub profile, and also start competing on this site called as Kaggle. So I'll just open up Kaggle for you folks. So I'll just open the site called as Kaggle. And this is a complete repository for data science and ML stuff. So here you have this tab called as Compete. And as you see, you have all of these competitions over here, which you can go and participate. And you have this tab called as Data. So here you will have a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of data sets. So let's say if you have seen this uh, TV series called as Game of Thrones, I'll just write down Game of Thrones over here. And you see you have a data set on Game of Thrones. So you can just go through this data set and start working on it. Similarly, one of my uh, you know favorite cartoon series or anime series has been uh, Pokemon. So I'll just write down Pokemon over here. And you see that we have lot of data sets with respect to Pokemon as well. So go to the site, uh, have a look at it and start working on the site. Suresh Biswas is asking, is it necessary to know ML in depth for business analyst role or like having a basic understanding will do? Um, 
the answer would be a basic understanding would be enough because again for a business analyst role what you would basically be doing is the exploratory data analysis part where you'll mostly be working with tools such as uh, you know r and you'll be using tableau so what you'll mostly be doing is data manipulation and data visualization so you'll be finding uh, simple insights from the data and you'll be showing those insights to your client or stakeholder in the form of beautiful graphs so i'd say maybe uh, learn a bit of bi tools such as tableau power bi uh, you know uh, ms bi and also focus on r and python and basic knowledge on ml should be enough to you know to get you that job role as a business analyst Lakshmi is asking is mathematics and data science available in great learning yes again we definitely have that i'll go over here and i will show that to you so again i'll go back to data science so sure you see that we have this uh, course on probability for data science then we've got the statistical methods for decision making then we've got predictive modeling and analytics so we've got all of these uh, courses on math as well so folks uh, i guess this would be it from my side uh, i've answered as many questions as i could and uh, we'll definitely meet up in the next session so thank you very much and also before signing off if you haven't yet liked our stream please do like it that would uh, encourage us a lot to come up with more such live sessions it will tell us that you love our sessions so please do like it and also if you haven't yet subscribed to our channel please do subscribe and also hit the bell icon so thank you very much and uh, stay safe uh, make sure that you are not traveling a lot during this pandemic and uh, i'll see you in the next live session folks thank you